Make sure you have water. Hope you found everything. Wow. So I hope that break was a well-needed break. And um, I am wearing my um, Eurovision hat once more because I, I forgot one of the most important countries here today. So um, I was told that that country might be able to outdo the United States. I'm not sure, but we'll see. So here we go. Capvert, Capverdine. Okay, okay, okay. Van Point. <laughs> okay, well, thank you to Rokaya and to Niha for, you know, helping our confidence meter rise. And I, I, I'm so happy and I'm so privileged to be a part of this wonderful event. And so now I think we have come to a point where we need to give ourselves some validation. And this is something that we as women, we failed to do. And I even heard one of our speakers uh, say that. So if you don't mind, I want you to hold your hands up and I want you to give yourself to the universe. And it's just a very relaxed moment. And I want you to repeat after me. I am who I am supposed to be. I am who I am supposed to be. I am the master of my destiny. I am the master of my destiny. I love me no matter the scars. I love you no matter the scars, the blemishes, the blemishes or, imperfections, or imperfections. For I am every woman. For I am every woman. All right, take that with you. <laughs> so now we're entering our second half of our confidence booster. So hang on a little bit longer. So our next speaker is from, again, the beautiful city of Paris, Paris. Marie is a strategic coach, French entrepreneur of Guyanan, Guyanan origin and born in Paris. After feeling the frustrations and anger at the non-recognition of her life as a black woman, Marie left the fashion sector and founded Nakili Works. And Nikili means to reclaim your narration. Nikili works as an empowerment and strategy agency which aims to offer concrete strategies for survival and response to women and men who are victims of racism at work. Marie's dynamic personality and strength coaches and trains victims to fight against discrimination and to find their inner confidence to persevere. Please help me welcome the dynamic Marie de Silva. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> so um, before um, before doing my thing, I, I, I need to do I need to tell you some things that. My phone is nearly dying, and my presentation is on my phone. So I'm in danger right now, and um, I'm performing confidence because ne uh, I'm nearly dying inside. <laughs> so let me go to my danger. Let me, let me strive in danger, OK? So um, you don't know me, and um, I already need you to trust me and do what I say. <laughs> So right now, I need you to take one minute of silence and think about um, a very painful moment. Um, a moment when you felt inadequate, illegitimate, and in the wrong place. I need you to think very specifically of this moment. I need you to dive in this painful moment. I need you to dive in the, um, the emotion you felt, the wrongness you felt, the injustice you felt, and the shame you felt. And we, we obviously gonna take one minute for that. I need you to close your eyes and think about that moment. I repeat, that, um, a moment when you felt inadequate, illegitimate, at the wrong place.
Thank you. Thank you so. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much <laughs> for doing what I'm saying. <laughs> so uh, even if, if uh, and I'm going to tell you about three things I love about this moment. Um, I love your scarf. I love the fact that you have uh, the same uh, jacket. How dare you? <laughs> um, I love the fact that you came with your baby and uh, it will be the most empowered baby in this world right now. <laughs> so uh, this baby is gonna take um, this baby gonna take the most powerful naps from now on. So this is powerful. I love the fact that we are. Um, the, I love the fact that, that the, um, there are like one or two men, not too many men. I think it's good. <laughs> <laughs> I like the fact we are the majority here, and uh, <laughs> and uh, I also like the fact that I'm free to speak as a black woman, and I will speak of a black woman perspective because. I don't know other perspective. Uh, and also, I'm free to say that I hate the word self-confidence. I hate it. I don't want to talk about self-confidence because it seems like you are dragging yourself in a quest that, do that doesn't exist. You are talking about seeking the sun growl during all your lifetime when you have what you need in your fucking pockets. So no, we, we're not going to talk about self-confidence because in my, uh, in my point of view, self-confidence is a state. And this is not something, this is something you will fight to, to have all your life. So we're not going to talk about it. I want to talk about another word, and I hope this works. Yay! Woo! I want to talk about abracadabra. I love this word. Really, I love this word. Because, yes, you heard me, abracadabra, the most beautiful word we ever existed. We are not talking about self-confidence anymore when you have this word and you know what it means. Abracadabra comes directly from Aramean, from Ada Kedabra, who means this thing must be destroyed. I love it. This thing must be destroyed. I love this and I think I will say it in every, in, in front of every man. <laughs> another meaning, abracadabra, could come from another expression, evra, kedevra, who means I'm creating as, as, as I speak. I'm creating as I speak. Remember, when I started, I asked you to close your eyes and think about the most painful moment when you felt out of place. And this painful moment deserves an abracadabra. I, would, I wanna tell you about my abracadabra. I wanna tell you what I destroyed and what I created. As you can see, I'm a beautiful, fat, black, dark-skinned woman. Right now, I'm just enumerating the things I considered being curses instead of blessings. I want to talk about the struggles of self-confidence when you're a fat, black, dark-skinned woman. I'm going to talk about dragging your fat, black body into a room and still feel powerful instead of self-conscious. I want to talk about not apologizing in white spaces, in white places, and white supremacy. Self-confidence for a black woman like me is all about forgiveness, compassion, and acceptance. Yes, acceptance. Because you need to accept that the validation you are seeking will only be provided by you. Yes, only you. How do I love myself when the society within I'm existing wants to see me disappear? How do I love myself when I'm struggling with racism, grossophobia, sexism, anti-blackness? How can I see the light when so many things are obstructing my sun? I worked 10 years in fashion, look, looking as I am now. And I did so many errors, and you know what? I'm gonna enumerate those errors because I have no shame. First of all, I'm, I'm guilty to saying that I had to shrink myself to pander, to please people's feelings. 
I also made the error to seek toxic love of my co-workers, a love only possible by making myself hating myself and shrinking. Nobody wants this kind of love. Love me when I'm flamboyant, big, strong. Love me when I say no. And right now, you need to perform a very important act of grief. I need you to grieve happily about not seeking about toxic validation anymore. Love me like you love a phoenix, in my ashes and my light. I made the error of not accepting that it can be flamboyance in B-plans. Know that every detour is an opportunity to be your most high self. As women of color, we're gonna face detours, we're gonna face racism, and racism is like a monster on the road, a monster on the road um, obligating you to do like a little detour. And we need to, we need, uh, we need to fail that. We need to accept that. And I also make the error of not seeking the magical in my blackness. Blackness is resilience. Blackness is power. Blackness is about surviving. And blackness is also about living, and this is what I'm doing right now. I'm living, I'm living my truth. I'm telling my truth and I'm not ashamed of my truth. You know what, I've been discriminated, I've been fired, I've been depressed. And all those trials lead to the most beautiful adventure of my life, being here and talking about how you can strive uh, and face uh, uh, the, race, uh, the racism in your uh, respects, um, in your, um, sorry, in your workplaces. And um, I, uh, right now, I, uh, I have uh, an employment agency who is helping people of color, not only facing, facing racism, but overcome it and take power from the underestimation. When someone is undermining you, you can win by knowing your forces when your enemy don't. So um, when uh, it was about like, uh, yeah, five years, I, um, I was fired from my uh, job in fashion because I couldn't do it anymore. After the firing, I, I had like two years of uh, a strong depression and uh, I barely could think about anything. And someone told me, you know what, Marie, you need to revisit the places you have been in order to go somewhere else. And this is what I did. Like, I took a book and I wrote about all the experiences I faced as a black, fat, dark-skinned woman. And you know what, this book is quite big. <laughs> um, and I wrote in this book quite religiously. Every day I wrote about my trials. I wrote about my humiliation as a black woman. And um, I remembered uh, a, particular, uh, a particular day when I was wearing an afro uh, on, my, uh, on my shop. And you have my manager who, uh, who arrived and, say, and said, oh my god your hair are not professional. I was like, what? And she said, yeah. You, I think, can you do something more professional? I mean, a little less ethnic? And I stood there in perfect situation. I was like, what the hell? What the hell is going on right now? And I couldn't say a word. So I just found the, the strength to, to say, okay, what do you want me to do? And she was like, I don't know, I don't know, it's you, huh? it's not, uh, I mean, it's up to you, but I need you to do something more professional, and I mean, if it's possible for you. And I was dominated, and I said, okay, yes. So uh, I ran to, um, I went to a beauty shop, and I, I, when I was like, okay, so you're gonna do me like some breads, and I'm gonna wrap, wrap them up like that. So, um, so uh, the next day, I'm arriving with my bread, and she said, ah, these are a little too more ethnic. Can you do something else? I was like, okay, and I did something else. So uh, I went back to my home, and uh, I relaxed my hair. So it's the very act of putting 
something you, you know as toxic in your hair to comfort white supremacy, to comfort white feelings. So um, I arrived uh, the next day with my hair relaxed and she was like, oh yeah, this is very nice, finally. <laughs> and I mean, it was so humiliating to feel this out of place. When I think of a moment when I felt the most out of place is this moment because someone was telling me that the way I looked wasn't professional, that um, the way I looked uh, uh, wasn't uh, an idea of professionalism. The very idea of being black and assume it wasn't professional. So I wrote this in my book and I really need something very cathartic. So I was like, okay, this is something very humiliating but I think I can learn from this. So I took this incident and I made an alternative ending. I was like, okay, so, okay. What I was like in my shop, waiting, okay. Wh what I did when I saw her arriving. And when I redo, when I replay the scene in my head, I know when she was arriving, I was already shrinking like that. Okay. And that's, and that's how she knew that she had the power to dominate me. And that's why I'm researching on uh, what we called the language of the body. Your body is telling everything. Right now, for example, I'm very stressed, but I had a new trick. So I have my beautiful lipstick, <laughs> leopard boots. <laughs> thank you, thank you for the boots. They're really expensive, so, okay. So I have my lipstick, I have my boots, I have my uh, green jacket, I have my provocative t-shirt. So okay, I'm all set. It's all about tricks because really I'm dying inside and I, and I can look at my phone because I'm already dying. Okay. Um, the thing is, it's all about all you can perform. And I learned that because um, this book, the book I was talking about, is, is, it, it was already a book of humiliations. And right now, I'm transforming it in a book of alternative endings. So the first uh, thing that I'm gonna say is write something and find an alternative, an alternative ending to, uh, to your trials, to your painful moments. You can rewrite them. And when you rewrite them, you can transform uh, these moments into strategies. And this is what I'm doing right now with my agency. All, uh, um, I'm talking about the strategies I've found after. And right now, I'm learning the strategies to people. I'm gonna talk about two people, very important. Ah. Yes, him, do you know him? <laughs> oh my God, oh my God. I mean, so, this is François Fillon, <laughs> okay? This is uh, a political Frenchman. And what you don't know is he robbed nearly 12 millions to the French. Okay, 12 fucking millions. And despite the fact that he robbed 12 millions, he had the audacity to still be running from presidents. I was like, man, you robbed. <laughs> you, have 12, you robbed 12 millions. What are you doing here? And he still had the audacity to be running from president. I was like, okay. Sometimes when I feel low, sometimes when I feel too fat, too black, too dark skin, I must take my, com I must carry myself in the room like a mediocre white man. <laughs> so when you are, when you're feeling low, when you're feeling too little, please act like a fucking white man, okay? <laughs> So thank you for coming. <laughs> um, now, really, it's really impressive. How how can you how can you run from president with an embezzling twelve millions? I will. I mean, come on. <laughs> right now, I want you to draw a line in your uh, in your notebooks, like draw a line like this. And uh, we're gonna say it's uh, the start line, the starting line, mm -hmm. the starting line, okay? 
This is a starting line. And uh, on this starting line, there is a few people. Uh, on the starting line, you will find men, white men, able, heterosexual, powerful, and rich, okay? And when you are not in this category, you are behind the start line. And I want you to calculate the distance, the distance you have run to be in the same places as those men, even if you were behind the start line. I start. For example, I'm not on the start line, obviously, because, for example, I'm a woman, so I'm like 10 meters behind the start line. I am fat, and grossophobia exists, so 10, me 10 meters again, so now we have 12 meters for me. Um, you didn't notice, but um, I have uh, quite a limp um, with my left leg, and because of the boots, you didn't see it. <laughs> so 30 meters. Uh, I have a poor background, uh, so uh, count, count, is it 40, 40 meters. Um, okay, so and so on. So I'm about like uh, 40 or 50 meters behind that departure line. And I'm here in front of you and I have a mic. <laughs> so I really need you to think about the distance you've run to be in those places. And I need you, when you enter a room and you don't feel confident, I really need you to think about your distance. And every time, you will see that you are the one who, have, uh, who has run the most distance, who has done uh, the most efforts to be here. And this distance needs to be respected. For, um, for example, when I'm entering a room and I feel too little and I feel too weak, or to uh, to uh, self anxious uh, to self conscious. I'm thinking about my distance, and, and, and thinking about this distance. I'm like, where is it going to respect my distance? Is it going to respect the efforts I made? I'm the most capable in this room because the society uh, didn't want me to be there, and you know what? I'm there. So you're going to respect the distance I made. You're going to respect my trials. You're going to respect my errors. Uh, two years ago, I was um, asking for funding from, um, from a uh, German association. So I'm entering a room, and there was like, and there, there was like eight, eight white men. I was like, OK, I'm dying right now. They're not, they're not going to give me my money. And I felt so little. And I made a decision, I, I was like, okay, so I'm not feeling self-confident right now, really not. I'm feeling weak, so right now, I'm gonna perform. And uh, I called uh, uh, my alter ego. So when I can't, my alter ego is taking the wheel. And my alter ego is a white man, whose name is Francois. <laughs> And Francois is helping me, is helping me uh, uh, doing my thing. So this is what I'm saying when I say, when you are feeling low, enter in a room like a mediocre white man. And to end, I need you, really, I really, I really need you, you to think about uh, uh, this start line affair, okay? Last thing is a shoebox. A shoebox. So, Maybe tomorrow or after tomorrow, I need you to take a shoebox, and then in this shoebox, you're gonna, you you you're not gonna put self confidence. You're gonna you're gonna gather data. We're gonna give you self confidence. For example, in my shoebox, I have all the mails of my clients, and when I'm doubting on myself, when I'm doubting about what I'm doing, I simply wash in my shoebox. So you need shoeboxes, okay? And, um, oh, my friend isn't there, okay. Okay, okay, God was with me, okay. Mm, yes, this is a shoebox, this is a magical shoebox. So, I will need you to think about another moment, and I need you to think about your next abracadabra. 
your next act of creation, your next act of destroying things who are holding you back. So we are right now thinking about our next abracadabra, what I need to destroy in order to create. And I will say, I'm so proud of, I'm sorry, I'm so proud of me first, and I'm so proud of you. I mean, come on. You need to, re you, need, you really need to have in mind your distance, okay? So maybe Monday when you're gonna go back to work, uh, maybe I need you to be able to see things that differently. I need you to enter in a room with your distance and I need you to act like if, you're, if this distance was everything. Thank you. Okay, Marie, start it. End it like you started, quick and done. So, <laughs> thank you. Wow. Wow. I'm full. Okay, I, I still have more. So, um, our next speaker can be found right here in our own Grand Duchy. Omozua. I did it. <laughs> Omozua is a high performance neuro agility trainer and executive coach who works with busy entrepreneurs and organizers to help them transform stress into performance super fuel and turn good leaders to greatness. She is the co-founder of the Systemic Neuroscience Consulting Group in Luxembourg and co-creator of the 3 to 5 Brain System Code. Omozua uses emotional agility and a neuroscience-based coaching approach to empower and prepare clients' hearts and heads to take the journey to live their best life. Her mission is to help people become future ready today and to teach others that creating a life on your own terms is the bravest thing you can do. It's my pleasure to present Omozua Azaraman. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, not easy to be the last one. Oh, good luck, young ladies. Um, thank you very much. Um, great speeches that we've heard today. When I was asked um, if I would like to speak at this event, um, and I asked Sandrine what is the topic, and she said, you know, entrepreneurship, women on an entrepreneurial journey, uh, leadership, and I thought, whoa, and she considered me. Okay, so what can I add? What value can I bring? And I thought back to when I started my entrepreneurial journey. I thought, you know, you, know, you, you need an idea, look at what other people do, and imitate. And just hope that somehow it will work. Get a you know, fancy, fancy business card and a website and, you know, fake it till you make it. <laughs> And it felt good for a while, you know, when you keep yourself busy, because people will ask you, what are you doing? And I'm working on my, bi my, bis my business, uh, my company. I'm working on my website. It sounds awesome. It sounds like, yeah, you're making it, girl. But well, we've all been there. Despite all those things I was doing, I didn't really feel I was making any step forward. And also, I didn't know who I was. I wasn't really sure. What, what are you doing? If you fall, are you going to be able to get up? And so, when it comes to me, oh, I have to, ah. I'm not going to say, I mean, thank you very much, you, Anita, great. I, when I hear that, it makes me think like, who is she talking about? <laughs> but that to me is everything that I have come to learn is necessary on the journey of being an entrepreneur, of standing up tall, of knowing who you are, despite what is going on around you, despite the challenges, learning. That's me. I'm going to start, the, the, the topic, I'm going to start with the approach 
is about this organ that we carry with us. All of us have a brain. I realized very early on that it didn't matter what I did, who I copied, who I obsessed about. If I was not strong in myself, I possessed nothing to stand up, to be strong, to go to a negotiation table, independent of if it was a blue person, black person, red person, green person, yellow person. You have to be strong in yourself. And I realize it is the one thing we need. We talk about success, strategy, traveling the world, growing a business, or even growing a company and making an impact. And how can that be if we don't know ourselves? So what does this start with? In the VUCA world, I don't know if you know the expression VUCA, the world we live in today is volatile, it's uncertain, it's complex, and it's ambiguous. And what that means is that everything that we have grown up with as that is how you do it, and then there is an outcome, it has changed, it is no more valid. You need today to be able to outcreate you need to do more than the usual. You need to outlearn. It's not enough to say, well, I did that when I was at school and I did my studies and that's it. It is not enough today. And you need to outthink, to utilize your whole brain. What does that mean? It means you need to be receptive. You need to be able to listen. You need to be able to speak up, like we've heard in different forms. You need to be able to be logical but you also need to embrace what's in you as a woman, as an intelligent, confident, talented, gifted woman. But even before that, you are a human. You. You. Accurate self-awareness. Just not, not, not just self awareness you know? Uh, I know that I can't walk on heels, so my sister, bought me, I haven't talked about this, so I'm just going to keep saying <laughs> She told me, if you wear these kind of boots, you're going to be fine. To be honest, I'm quite shocked that I'm not in pain. <laughs> um, you know, it's good. But I'm talking of the self, the accurate self-awareness. You, on your entrepreneurial journey, if you want to be promoted, if you want to join a board, if you want to be an advisor, if you want to start an organization, you need to have a accurate self-awareness. Know who you are. Because you know when you wake up in the morning, the one person you should please first is you. The one person you are going to encounter 24-7 is you. The one person who is going to sit in front of somebody to say, I need funding, I want a promotion, I have an idea. That one person that you need to motivate is you. And we can't keep on just going through the world not knowing who we are. Your ability to use your strength from within means you're not going to be waiting to be saved. We are talented. Many of us speak more than two languages. We've got masters, PhDs, degrees. We don't need to be saved. What we need to do is to wake up and realize what you bring to the table and stand up tall and activate it. Because bringing, talking about the brain, potential that is not exercise, practice, with no skills, remains potential. Think of how many people that can sing like Beyonce. But if Beyonce doesn't practice, get up in the morning at five, exercise and do all those things she does, which I'm not going to do, it won't look that good when she goes on stage. So your potential is nothing. If you do not think you need to polish it like a diamond, and diamonds don't shine if you don't polish it. We are talented, gifted, educated. We bring a lot to the table. You have a business idea. You have a passion. You feel a fire within you. 
But the one thing that you need to make, I'm a, I'm a friend of cocktails. I love cocktails, <laughs> the perfect cocktail. So you've got to be the perfect cocktail. You need to make sure that the mix is healthy, tasty, aromatic, whatever. You need your self-esteem, your confidence, not the fake one, not that one that comes from, you know, those things we can buy and hang on ourselves. That, I'm not talking of that. I'm talking of the thing, the confidence that you need, that when you fall, you know it hurts. But you know what? I'm going to get up and I'm going to stand tall. Because as long as we are alive, you can't remain lying. You need to always get up, one way or the other. And you need your strength to do that. On the journey of entrepreneurship, <laughs> when I started, I thought it's going to be smooth. Imitate everybody, have your business card, and everything is going to be fine. And through mistakes, I came to realize it isn't like that at all. This is the one thing that nobody tells you. Because when you start, you hire a business coach, and they tell you, business card, website, da 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 da. And then you ask yourself, why is it not working? Why isn't it smooth? Get used to that. That's awesome. <laughs> that is the journey of an entrepreneur. Up, down, middle. There are obstacles. But let me tell you one thing about the obstacles, what they have taught me. Obstacles have taught me, hello, Omozua. I'm here to activate your juices. <laughs> it is a message. Obstacles are messages not to stop, not to cry, and if you cry, you can dry it up and continue, huh? It's okay, let's be human. But obstacles are a message to continue. Okay? Obstacles are a way for you to self-motivate yourself because things will change. 2020, like no other year in our, for, uh, for 21st century people, has shown us that you cannot focus and depend solely on what you think happened before March 2020. You've got to be adaptable, you've got to adjust, you have got to continue building yourself and to be prepared. Many of us, we go out into companies, but 2020 said stay home. So what do you do? Your brain and leadership. Every time I go to a, a training and I talk about uh, the brain, people go, what did she just say? Brain? I thought this is a leadership training. But I want to tell you something about the brain or your leadership. Your, if you are a team leader, if you're a manager, if you actually interact with people, to lead, you need a brain that is able to focus. Focus, because you can see what happens when you are focused, there is creativity, there is fulfillment. You are able to motivate yourself, you are able to achieve, you are able to relate well, you are able to build a tribe, you are able to connect with people who will help you to even spread your message. But if you are reactive, what is going to happen is, what is going to happen is you are going to be reactive, fearful. You're not going to be able to focus on what you need to step forward, step by step. And that is what you need on your journey. And back in the days, I didn't know that. I just thought like, well, why? These self-help books. I felt motivated when I read them and I knew, oh, yeah. But the minute I closed the book, back, same old, same old. <laughs> Till I understood that. You need to understand your brain because your brain can either propel you forward on your journey or your brain is going to make you sabotage yourself. The dinosaur is just a lizard. Now what do I mean by that? On our journey, you're going to get a lot of input. Some are from you, 
and some are from other people, and you're going to think a lot, and you're going to have all this dialogue. Should I do it? Am I enough? I know I just fin finished another certification. Uh, if I talk to that person, will he believe me? Oh, my goodness, I should just stay at home. Maybe I should just go back to an entrepreneur, uh, you know, find a, a corporate job, uh, just, just be simple, give up my dream. When you start your entrepreneurial journey, you're going to ask for funding, you're going to have to talk to ministries, you're going to ask for help. You're going to need to do so. That's called change. And the brain does not like change. The brain will tell you, oh, come on. Don't go to that meeting. Postpone. Sit on your sofa and watch Netflix. <laughs> Is, do, yeah, you can relate to that, right? You can relate to that. You know that letter, that proposal, if you just send it and your brain is gonna go, I feel you're stressed, I wanna keep you alive. Just go to the fridge and just have a Bridget Jones moment. Get yourself some <laughs> ice cream. That feels good. But do you know what? It's the same brain trying, the same brain that will help you to motivate will also keep you safe if it feels that you are releasing too much cortisol, you are too stressed, and you will go for the ice cream. And there goes your project, your success, anything you can achieve. Identify and eliminate the unnecessary. Now, on the, on the other side, you see a brain cell that is happy. And then you see a brain cell that is stressed. You can't focus when you're stressed. You can't be creative when you're stressed. You cannot be innovative when you're stressed. And you can't relate well. And you won't even like yourself when you're stressed. So stress is one thing that I learned on my journey is key priority before the fancy business card. To think like a leader, act like a leader, and to impact like a leader, you need to start with what you have, how you are, where you are. And why do I say that? Because when I started my journey, people told me, look at that lady, this is what she does, and look at that person, that's what he does. And I was aiming to be like them. But the one thing they don't mention is that that person started 15 years ago. They've gone through a journey, so how can you, you can't jump a step. You need to take those steps. So if you obsess about somebody and be like them, you don't know what's going on behind. Maybe they've got five VAs, personal assistants, who, do, who does everything, and then you think, whoa, that's brilliant. I want to be like that. Be careful about what you focus on. Start from where you are, because the brain will say, I don't know what you're doing, but that seems and feels too big. Project, entrepreneurship, no regular salary? Come on, girl. Go and do your nails. That feels good. We have everything we need. I brought these numbers just to show that they, with studies that was done, this one was done by Harvard Business Review, showing the percentile of what women bring to the table when it comes to leadership. That report said that women possess 17 of the leadership skills. So you see, we don't even need to go and look for it. It is there. We just need to activate it. Know yourself. And take care of yourself. Sleep. Food. Stress. Brain fitness. Take care of yourself. Brain fitness, you can help that. Keep on learning. Take nurturing your brain because Take it important because it influences your performance and your productivity and everything you can achieve. And surround yourself with the right people and be okay with whoever you are, as long as they are growing you. Sometimes you're gonna be around the turtles, that's nice and groovy. And sometimes you will see and feel that you need to grow and you need to be among the giraffes. Be okay with the phase you are at on your journey. 
and know what you are ready to say yes to on any given day. What are you ready to say yes to? Are you ready to, to, to go against the grain? Are you ready to challenge the status quo that is keeping you from reaching what you want to do? Are you ready to be vulnerable and be okay when people say emotional? Now, when men say you're emotional, ladies, just give them a smile. Because actually, since men and women possess a brain, and every brain has an emotional part, it logically means everybody is emotional. <laughs> yes? It is not an insult. Say yes to not allowing anyone underestimate you. And how does that start? When you know yourself, when you have got the healthy cocktail, nobody can, even if they try. Final takeaway. Make it a habit to pause and always ask, who am I? Don't travel any journey wherever you are without asking. Take a pause, you know, every now and then, whether you journal, whether you write it down, but ask. Who am I? And also know that your entrepreneurial journey will start. I'm going to say something funny. It's quite embarrassing. When I started, I was looking for a name for my title. And somebody said, oh, call yourself a life satisfaction coach. <laughs> okay. So one of my first titles, life satisfaction. So people said, yeah, but what does that mean? What does that mean? Anyways, now I'm a neuro coach. That's okay, I'm a brain coach, but it's been a journey. It's been a journey. Things will evolve. Never lose eye of your focus, because when you have your eye on your focus, when you have your eye on the greater good, you will always be able to do you and be you, no matter your look, no matter your size, no matter your height, no matter your skin color, because at the end of the day, we are human and we don't live on an island, we interact. And I believe in having compassion also means when I can understand myself, I can see where somebody else has difficulty to understand me, and with compassion, I can enable that person to see humanity. My life message is be CEO of your brain because it drives your experience and your outcome. Be future ready by always learning, because this is your competitive advantage, and be brain friendly. Learn how to be brain friendly because it allows you to have compassion for yourself. And on this entrepreneurial journey, you need to have compassion for yourself because you're going to make mistakes and it's normal. Now to you. If you write that sentence down in your notebooks, my life message is, and make that what you take with you as you go on your journey. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Omazua. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And Marie, thank you. <laughs> it's, it's so much, I'm just like, uh, I'm like, when I'm in Louis Vuitton, I'm just like going crazy. I'm like, oh my God, there's so much to do and so much to buy. So thank you all so much. And now it is time for you all to participate. So we've come to our question and answer session. So if you've had a chance to write down any questions, um, it's time to ask. So give us a minute. We want to get the mic. And um, someone will come around to you. And... Uh, Okay, so if you don't mind, um, just show us our, raise your hand, and um, our two ladies with the mics will come to you. You can ask your question. 
Um, feel free to, if you don't know the name, just let me know um, to propose your question to. So, yes? Uh, is it okay when I ask in French? Just, just yes. Try it. Yes, it's okay. Uh, to be honest, they speak so much good French, so it could be fun. Voilà, tout d'abord, un gros merci pour cette conférence. Euh, je dois dire que je suis venue à cette conférence parce que quand j'ai vu le nom Rokaya, je me suis dit, euh, je n'ai pas réfléchi deux fois parce que je suis un grand fan et je vous suis euh, aussi sur Instagram. Mais étant assis ici, à chaque fois euh, que l'une des femmes a pris parole, j'étais là, j'avais vraiment le petit enfant intérieur qui était là, « Waouh, wow, génial, génial, super !» Donc c'est vraiment un grand moment. Donc euh, ma première question, c'est pour vous, Kaya. Euh, en fait, euh, comme je vous suis sur Instagram et euh, aussi sur euh, YouTube, je vois les attaques, euh, tous les attaques. Com comment est-ce qu'on vous attaque c'est d'une façon tellement exécrable, et même les accusations. Et ma question, c'est vraiment, comment est-ce que vous trouvez la force mentalement pour tenir Et pour tenir, tenir tête à toutes ces personnes. C'est bon, là Tu es là Oui. Là, c'est bon. On va parler. Oui, oui. Ok, super. Merci beaucoup pour votre, bah déjà pour votre témoignage voilà, de, de soutien et pour votre question. C'est vrai que la question de, du, du bien-être et de la manière dont on s'en sort soi, soi c'est très très important. Moi, en fait, euh, ce que j'ai compris en fait, au fil des années, c'est que les agressions, les injures, en fait, ne s'adressaient pas directement à ma personne, mais au personnage public. Et je pense que le fait d'avoir appris à dissocier le personnage de la personne, ça m'a beaucoup aidé en fait à comprendre qu'il ne s'agissait pas de moi, que tant, tant de moi que de ce que, que ce que je représente en fait, en étant une personne qui vient subvertir l'espace public. Donc il y a ça, et après, euh, ce que je fais aussi, c'est que je choisis beaucoup les, les moments où je parle. C'est-à-dire que je, je prends la parole en fait quand j'en ai envie, soit parce que c'est un contrat, enfin, parce que c'est un contrat, donc j'ai des chroniques hebdomadaires, soit parce que je décide d'aller à tel et tel endroit. Ça veut dire qu'en fait, la plupart du temps, je passe beaucoup de temps à décliner mes sollicitations. Et c'est des choses qu'on ne voit pas. Et enfin, pour moi, le plus important, c'est vraiment d'être bien entouré. Apparemment, moi, c'est ce, ce qui me tient au jour le jour, c'est que j'ai un entourage qui n'a rien à voir avec mon environnement professionnel et qui me permet effectivement bah, d'avancer tout simplement et de prendre du recul aussi par rapport à ce qui peut être des polémiques extrêmement graves. Et enfin, euh, je pense qu'il faut aussi rappeler que le droit existe et que la loi s'applique. Donc, quand ça va trop loin, je porte plainte. J'ai déjà fait condamner plusieurs personnes et, euh, et j'ai porté plainte contre, je pense, une vieille allusion à, à un philosophe euh, mal placé. Euh, eh bien, j'ai attaqué, euh, voilà, je porte plainte contre lui, donc c'est en cours, mais je pense que c'est important de rappeler aussi que la justice est partie à un petit moment. Voilà. Merci. Merci. Is there anyone else? Thank you. Uh, it was very interesting, and uh, we received a lot of um, convincing uh, messages. So thank you to all of you. And my questions, I have also a lot of questions, but the first one is also for Okaya. So what kind of advice would you give to someone who doesn't stay at, uh, in place and uh, uh, feels like everything she is doing, uh, she is uh, doing, um, adopting such attitudes? is wrong. What kind of advice would you do that? So, um, when, when you say that it's wrong, is it wrong for you or for the others? That's the first question, right? Mm -hmm. I think it's others. <laughs> so, it means that um, is it important for you to be convenient for the others or to follow your, your own goals? It's not the same. 
that if you need to please the others, it doesn't it doesn't require the same attitude that if you need to focus on your own you know your own business. And I think to me, what I really learned from doing what I do was to accept to be you know to be this season. I, I accept that people don't like me. I'm okay with that. And it's not you know it's not uh, easy. Because you, you're raised to be nice to people and you don't like not to be liked. But as soon as you accept the fact that people don't like you and you accept the fact that it's their problem, if people hate you, they have the hate inside themselves. You don't have, you don't carry the hate. As soon as you accept that, you can just focus on what is important to you. But you need to accept that. If you don't accept um, that, you need to, to choose something else because it's, it's something that you will face. Thank you. You're your insightful talk. Um, I have a question for Naya. Um, you mentioned how important it is to keep the why. Yes. And uh, many times we have the why in our head. We are uh, motivated to do and the day after we are not anymore. We have this fix all the time. So my question is how can we keep the why in a long term perspective or which tricks do you use or can you advise to keep this why clear in a long-term perspective. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, so for me, what I have, what has worked for me is to have your vision in place because that is one thing which will never change because that's the reason in the first place why you started out in your business. Now having that vision in place, after that you kind of keep mo changing your why. The reason for that, having a why, is so that you don't get influenced by somebody else's why. Like for example, why Omozua is doing what she's doing is not the same as why I'm doing what I'm doing because we have completely different lifestyles, right? And uh, she is not married, no? Yeah, she does, she's not married and doesn't have children. And so, but I have a family and I have two kids and I, I wasn't sure, for example, when uh, whether I should be here or I might just go back two years later. So my why, and she's very sure that she loves Luxembourg and this is her place to be and she might just end up retiring here, right? But if I talk to her and I use her why and make that as mine, I'm going to be screwed because I'll always feel that it is, I'm never doing enough. But I have a couple of other things in my platter as well. But at the same time, the vision is not changing because whatever your why is, you're still trying to achieve that. So that would be my uh, two, p two cents. But also, I, I would like to mention, my why has also changed every couple of years. Uh, two years back, I uh, did my nationality and I took Luxembourgish nationality. So now I see it a little more long term. And then I now I want to invest in it. Now I want to invest in even getting a website to be made by someone else. Or the, earlier it was like, okay, make something and just so that you are out there, right? And you don't want to put in the money. So, but at the same time, the vision still hasn't changed. So I would say your lifestyle, your needs, etc., should define your why. The, did I answer? That? Yes. Thank you. Much. Thank you. Can I have a second question? So we don't have enough time. We are out. Yeah. <laughs> Bah, merci beaucoup parce que j'écoute euh, beaucoup vos podcasts. Marie da Silva, merci euh, pour, euh, pour euh, ce que vous faites euh, pour le milieu du travail, pour la femme noire. C'est très important. En tout cas, moi, j'ai eu des problèmes au boulot en dernier et j'ai écouté euh, ce que vous avez dit, comment il fallait nous y affronter. Et, euh, merci beaucoup. Et euh, Okaya, merci beaucoup, parce que grâce à vous et euh, votre euh, agraphie, <rire> euh, j'apprends beaucoup de choses. Et franchement, merci euh, de pour tout ce que vous faites. C'est juste ça. Merci beaucoup. Merci. Merci.
Bonjour à tous, euh, je suis Mandé, je suis ravie d'être avec vous aujourd'hui. Euh, je voulais revenir à peu près sur toutes les, sur, sur toutes les présentations qui ont été dites ici aujourd'hui. Je trouve qu'il y a un point commun, en fait, il y a un lien, euh, euh, un fil directeur dans toutes les présentations, dans le sens où tous les sujets que vous avez touchés, euh, je l'ai relu en un mot, c'est une question de maturité. C'est un processus que vous avez identifié, toutes, de par vos, de par vos, vos parcours singuliers, et en fait, nous toutes ici, je pense que, d'une manière générale, euh, on est dans ce processus de maturité. Alors c'est sûr, on l'a, on a, comment on ça, on a identifié dans l'entrepreneuriat, mais c'est aussi un processus humain de, de, de passer d'une phase où on se pense petit, puis on se voit grandir vers un personnage qui est totalement différent de ce qu'on s'était qu qu imaginé il y a un, un an, deux ans, cinq ans, etc., etc. Donc je trouve que c'est très bien. Vous avez résumé, et je pense que de faire l'expérience d'entrepreneurs euh, qui, qui travaillent avec des, avec des entrepreneurs de la diversité aussi, euh, énormément de personnes euh, d'origine euh, issues de, de l'immigration, du Cameroun, euh, de la Côte d'Ivoire, ont besoin de ce type de conversation-là pour grandir dans leur parcours individuel. Merci. This is your time to ask questions, so. So, um, thank you all, all your four. Um, I have to decide which question, so uh, I will take this one because it's one that um, I'm, I'm already thinking about it, I'm reading also about it, but I, maybe one of you wanted to uh, answer it. And I'm thinking a lot about uh, positive discrimination. I mean, um, you said it with your T-shirt, that diversity is the new bullshit. And um, yeah, sometimes I'm confronted or yeah, confronted like um, the, that the people think that the position that I have or uh, the place that I am is about yeah, getting black women in the front line. And um, yeah. My question is then to you, what are you thinking about positive discrimination or is there more? I mean, um, is that everything about quota too? Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, uh, positive, uh, positive discrimination as in um, affirmative action, right? Okay. so. If someone is believing that you are here only because you're a black woman, I mean, let him believe it. I mean, the, the thing is, when you are in your workplace, all, uh, if you are um, the only black woman there, people are gonna assume that you are not here for uh, your competence. So there will always be uh, a denial of what you are trying to do. So the thing is to fight this denial by um, put your work first. Like, okay, so we are, you are saying that I'm here because I'm a black woman, but strangely, I'm better than you. Mm -hmm. <coughs> you hear um, talking about the fact that I, I didn't work enough to be here, but strangely, I work enough. Mm -hmm. So here I am. And you need really to think about, I think in something related to the imposter syndrome, because we are in a, in, in a society uh, where women are, are not socialized to success. So wh when you are not socialized to success, you let people undermining you. And the thing is, you have to fight to, to not be uh, undermined. And um, how you fight it? You fight it by uh, daring to be at the center of the room. Because uh, there is a really bad temptation to be invisible. Sometimes you want to be invisible because you are the only black woman in the room, but you have to, to fight this uh, temptation. So it's about putting yourself out there. It's about, upset, upset, uh, it's about accepting to be the center of the room. It's about not being likable, like you said. It's about daring to say no. And it's about really, uh, I'm sorry to say this, but sometimes you need to be a bitch. And you need to accept it. Thank 
you again for, uh, for the great insight that was very powerful. Um, I have a question, and I think this will be mainly for you, Marie, or anyone else who wants to answer the question. What do you think about the fact that we, I mean, I have a reflection. We are conscious that we start way behind the line of the, the standard, let's say. We, we, we know that, but still doesn't change the fact that we are judged, judged on the same criteria. Uh, and whatever the efforts we are doing, we will still be judged on the same criteria. And how do we really uh, change the narrative and um, for ourselves, first of all, without having to spend too much time justifying our circumstances and really fight the right fight for ourselves? Uh, you know what? I just uh, discovered the fact that um, I am not responsible of what people are projecting into me. So I'm not responsible of people's sexism or people's racism. Uh, I am not responsible for that. So I think about this is your problem. This is not mine. So I'm not gonna. So I'm not gonna fight to answer to your problem. This is your problem. You need to resolve it without me because I have no time for this. First, uh, first um, and the second thing is, how can you change the narrative? Um, I mean, we all in our four speeches we talk about compassion, and I think this is, this is all we need to have for ourselves, because when you have compassion for yourself, um, your er your errors uh, are becoming uh, learning experiences, because you when you are accepting your errors, you are um, I mean working against the society dehumanization. So this is how ch you change your narrative by having compassion, by um, by willing to really managing your time by not accepting, justifying your humanity. I mean, I never if I'm not paid, I never speak in front of a white a white audience of racism. Never. So this is something I do because I, I'm like, okay, so if I'm not paid, why we are go to, through the pain? I mean, come on. You, it, it's about having purpose. And when your purpose is about only you, this is how you change the narrative. Because you are only taking you in account. While we're getting to that question, can I ask a really quick question also for um, for Mazua? You talked about the brain and, and like sometimes it tells us not to do something. How do you know when you should do it and how do you know when your brain is, you know, how do you decipher between what's good to do and what's li listening to your brain to not do? but it's actually quite easy and it goes back to what we talked about earlier which is what is the vision and what is the mission and what is your goal and if you have that goal that means if you're having an inner dialogue uh, I talked about being um, having self accurate self understanding what are the thoughts right now take a piece of paper write down what those thoughts are and just ask the question, does this thing that I'm thinking right now lead to my goal? If it does, then go ahead with it. If it doesn't, then you have to question what is wrong with it or find um, how you can adjust it so that it could, because it's always about the mission. If somebody would have told me at the beginning of this year that I would be the country partner for NeuroAgility, a company that exists for 30 years of Benelux and Germany, I would have said, get out of here. Who are you? I, I can't do that because the inner talk would be, you can't do that, who do you think you are, right? You know that ne negative self-talk, but I wrote that on the paper and I was able to say, oh my, look, this is what we bring to the table. You are this, 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 this. And with that, you can do that. So it doesn't matter what anybody says, rather the truthful, honest self-assessment that you make of yourself. Because at the end of the day, when I sit at a negotiation table, 
with a company who has 200 employees and say, this is the price I want, that's the way it is, because I can't. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So the question is, um, as a black woman, I think we've all experienced um, rejection, if not racism, in a way or, or in other. How do you, how do you cope with that in the sense of not getting trapped in the in, in the game of communalism? Like, oh, if I'm rejected by this kind of people, then I'm only going to hang out with or work or do business with people from my community. Um, although I think it's a good thing, but I don't think this, does, it, this is a solution. So that should be my question, my question for one of you. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, thank you for your question. My response to that is I'm doing both. Like for example, uh, I work for a very mainstream media uh, and I comment very, very general politics, like uh, you know, news in France and uh, internationally. But when it comes to speaking about race, I know that it's very, it would be very difficult to speak, you know, very deeply about race on France Inter or you know, that kind of session. So I decided to create a podcast with my friend Rafi, <coughs> who is from Asian descent, and we went to actually a producing company that is owned by white people. But I, we knew that they would, you know, they would support us. And we created our own space in, you know, we speak about race on our, on our own terms. And that's what I do when I write a book, when I make a documentary, I just choose to create a space in order to speak about race or gender in a way that, you know, that suits me. And, you know, I just have that balance, like going <coughs> to a major mainstream media to speak about gender and politics and speaking, you know, diving to race or gender with my own creation. That's how I do that. And you know, I don't, I don't care being accused of being communitarist at the same time because, you know, as you know, as long as you're a person of color and you do something with another person of color, you will be seen as someone who is communitarist. So, you know, it, it, in fact, if you, if you, if you are, fa you know, if you know, if you are proud as a person of color, you will be seen as someone who rejects, uh, you know, the majority. You would be at some at some point accused of uh, of of being that person if you address race or things like that. So I would say, like um, like just like Marie said just uh, before, I don't care about how people label me. I know who I am, and it's the most important thing to me. Thank you very much. Uh, it was very interesting. And thank you very much to Let's Project and uh, all the organization. It's very good. And thank you to have us here. And my question was uh, not really a question. Uh, I'm a Zua. I, I hope I say the name correctly. <laughs> but I think uh, you said, know who you are. I think for all of you for the feeling is that you know who you are mm -hmm. and you don't care and you go on. I think that is the message for all of us. So thank you. Uh, one more question. <laughs> so we take all this, the, the topic from a um, sociolo soci soci sociological background. Um, I want to drive a line onto the um, financial from financial um, point of view. We are all entrepreneurs uh, facing, uh, or maybe people working in, in offices, facing having projects, uh, facing discrimination, discrimination when it comes to launching our projects, getting clients. Um, did we ever thought about how we can uh, bridge the gap for us to be included in the economical so uh, society as we claim to our place as entrepreneurs. Because I believe okay, we are at all different stages in, in, in our entrepreneurial journey, sure, uh, but at some point we want to grow. 
we also want to grow with people who are founding us, who trust um, the business that we're putting on the market, the people that we're targeting. If we are targeting min minority or not, it doesn't matter. But we're targeting clients, customers that are paying for a service that we're offering. So is there a way that we could um, start talking about how um, and minority entrepreneurs can have access to funding from institutional funds, uh, I mean, people working in, in, in the funding uh, in the funding in the industry in Luxembourg and actually also in France and, and, and overseas as well, because uh, the, the, the same um, access to funding is recurrent over the US, over over the UK, in France, and or any other country where we talk about minority and access to funding. Uh, actually, we will have a masterclass dedicated to uh, money and women, money and power. So that will be the, the occasion to talk about that. Just for your information. I think it's a I think it's a tough question because now I'm I'm not a, an expert on this really. Uh, I just have a friend who happened to be another entrepreneur. And uh, it reminds me of a story she told me. She was um, as uh, she was um, taking from fa uh, from um, from founds, and um, uh, the, the guy who was uh, in the meeting told her like, "You have the wrong sociology. You are a woman. You are not white. So that's why you are not. So that's why you're not able to uh, to reach." Uh, the money you want to make, uh, the money you want to ask, sorry. And uh, we talk about that and I was like, okay, so um, corporate foundings are uh, really afraid of us as women of color, so what can we do? And I think is uh, we need to find some alternative solutions. For example, when I needed founds, I was like, okay, uh, where, can I, where can I find the founds? And the founds were the people, actually, because, I, uh, because I'm, uh, I'm talking about my activity online. Um, I'm trying to be very present on, on social media. And um, I, I'm like, OK, what I'm saying um, as a value. And I need people to think about this value. And I, I need people to engage uh, in the value I'm proposing. So um, I would say for me, for my personal journey, I started from people. And right now, founds are like, okay, this person is interesting and people are really um, engaged in paying her for what she does. Why not us? So I think uh, it, it's a very modest advice, but I, I, I'm talking about my personal journey. I started from the people and right now I'm, I'm, I'm starting to talk with companies. And I think it's very difficult to have the other way around, company to people. I start from the people, right now I'm talking to company. And um, I did this um, uh, while being present online, uh, make myself known and like that, because I have uh, an activity who is uh, compatible with that. I don't know if I'm answering to your question, but. Okay. So I'm sure you all still have a lot of questions and it has been so interesting and we thank you so much for your questions. We thank you also. So we would like to give a small gift of appreciation to these wonderful ladies who have trekked on the train to be here and trekked on the cold Luxembourg day to be here. So we just want to show them just a small appreciation of being here for us and giving us an opportunity to have a sneak peek in their life of confidence and women's leadership. <laughs> so ladies, before my time has ended, I just want to say the Peanut Project's desire is that you leave here today with a flame that's been lit a flame that only you can extinguish. We hope that after today, you're energized and encouraged. 
that our speakers have inspired you to be an inspiration to someone else. Because that's what every woman is all about. reaching its end. We look forward to the second masterclass in 6th February, another exciting masterclass under the theme Woman, Power, and Money. I want to close today's event by simply saying thank you. Thank you all for joining today's event. Thank you for your commitment and thank you for your passion. I want to thank Madame La Ministre for taking her time and uh, being with us today, she, she left. But I also want to, take, to thank the Ministry of Family, Integration and the Greater Region for having funded the first edition of Project Peanut. I want to thank Chambre de Commerce for having made available this great auditorium for this event today. I want to thank our guest speakers Rokaya, Maria, Omoswa, and Neha. Thank you so much. <laughs> Our partners, Adem, Nuco, Touchpoint, thank you so much. Let's rise up hard work, extend to other interesting projects. Colonial memory, which is the colonial history of Luxembourg. Legislation is the analysis of anti-discrimination current law in Luxembourg. Education, which organizes a training anti-racism that will start on November 30. We do need your contribution. We do need lawyers. We do need teachers. We do need historians. We also encourage you to regularly check out project section of our new updates in our website, letsriseup.com. We would like you to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Thank you so much for attending this event. And please do not forget just to leave your uh, headset on the table. And finally, before you leave, we would be grateful if you could take a few minutes to complete our questionnaire our hostess will help you with that. Thank you and see you at the next master class. Thank you.